We've been talking about the k-means clustering algorithm. We're going to focus here implementation-wise on what's available in scikit-learn, which is a hard boundary type implementation. So let's look at some code. You already have a skeleton available to you. It's a k-means scale. I've already set up all of the appropriate imports. In particular, I'm pulling from the scikit-learn cluster package, the k-means uh, class implementation. So let's go ahead and accept that. I've also provided a scatterplot function for you. It's based on a, a similar function that, that we've done in a previous video. Uh, it takes as input a feature set, a set of samples in, in a feature space. It can take in a set of predictions, but it doesn't have to. And it can also take a set of cluster centers. Uh, but again, by default, there, there are none. If predictions are not given, then what this function does is it just does a standard scatter plot of the points within the feature space. And we're assuming here that it's a two-dimensional feature space. It just plots green dots for all of the points. If class labels are given in this prediction variable, then, then we drop into this else case. And here, we're actually using the scatter plot function. The point locations, again, are determined based on the feature values but the color here is determined by the, the class labels. And as we were doing before, I'm also using the rainbow color map. So what that means is for a small number of clusters, we'll have a, uh, a, a very distinct set of colors uh, that are plotted. And then finally, if cluster centers are also given, then we plot those as well. I'm, I'm just computing the min and max cluster labels so that I can make the, the colors very distinct from one another. And, and then I'm using the, the centers uh, for those points. Uh, when marker is set to D, that means that gives you a diamond. And I'm setting the size of the markers to 100, which is pretty darn large, but it's going to make the diamonds really stick out. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and execute that. The data set that we're first going to look at is one that we were playing with uh, back when we were working with support vector machines. Uh, so this is the, the classification data set. It's already available within the ML Practices Git repository. In this case, we're just using the input features, and I'm going to skip loading the the class labels since we're interested in the unsupervised uh, process here. So I'm load up that data. All right, so first let's use our scatter plot function to uh, look at those that data set. And so there we go. When, when I actually created this data set, I actually created five different uh, Gaussian distributions. And you can see those positioned here. There's one very clear one there. There's one here, one here. And then this region here, they're actually in, in the actual implementation, there are two different Gaussian distributions that I was sampling from. One sort of sits in this area here and the other that sits over here. So if we were to go back and look at the true class labels, that, that would nominally be the partitioning that we would get. But here the question is, can our k-means algorithm actually discover this structure? So let's give that a try. So I'm going to go ahead and create a model. And I encourage you, again, to look at the documentation for the k-means class. We'll play with a couple of different parameters here. Uh, first off, we get to say how many clusters. I'm going to start with two. I'm going to select uh, initialization to be random. And what that means for this particular k-means class is that it goes out to the training set and picks some number of points and uses those as the initial 
cluster centers. So this particular algorithm, it can get stuck in local minima. So if it guesses really poorly on the cluster centers, uh, one can end up with a very poor assignment of, of the cluster centers. Uh, what n init does as a parameter is that it says, let's pick a set of random cluster centers, we'll execute the algorithm. Uh, in this case, I'm asking for just one of those steps. Uh, but if I were to set this, say, to 10, what it means is that we would have 10 random restarts and then uh, for each one of those, an execution of the algorithm, and then it makes a judgment as to which one it's actually going to keep. So for the time being, I'm going to go ahead and set that to 1. And this random restart kind of an approach is, uh, is something that we end up using for a lot of learning algorithms where we're doing gradient descent or gradient descent in situations where we can have local minima or maxima. And then finally, we can also set uh, how many processors are getting used. I'll just set that to negative one. And then let's go ahead and fit our model. Oops, it's in jobs. There we go. So that only took about a second for execution. Let's go ahead and then do our class label assignment. And one of the things that we get out of this model after we've done learning is that there's a property called cluster centers that we can actually view. So there are the two cluster centers that have been assigned. And let's go ahead and plot these results. OK, so I'm handing it this, the set of samples, the cluster labels, one for each sample and then also handing it the centers for the clusters. The big diamonds are the cluster centers, and then the coloring indicates the cluster assignments for all of the samples in the data set. And, and it's actually done a reasonable job from the perspective of having to deal with two different clusters. Another possibility could be to take this point here and, and move it out over here uh, and absorb some of these other points here. Um, but what that would mean is that we would end up with one really big cluster and one really small cluster, and the k-means algorithm really wants to try to balance that out a little bit more. For fun, let's execute this again to see if we end up with the same sort of answer. And, and we've essentially, we've done the same thing. This cluster of points still belongs to the left-hand cluster. Okay, so let, let's try to uh, to move up to three clusters. And, and there we go. So now that, that right-hand side cluster has been partitioned into two different pieces. One could imagine that third cluster being used to capture this region here, but Really, this is probably a better balance of points uh, into the clusters. But for fun, let's go ahead and execute that one more time. We're going to get a new assignment. Uh, but in this case, the learning algorithm has made the, the same choice. OK, so let's bump this three up to four. And at this point, we'd expect that middle region to get its own cluster. And indeed, it has. And that probably is a pretty stable choice as well. OK, so the, the coloring changed, but the assignments, the, the clustering of the points really hasn't changed all that much. All right, so let's bump this up to five, which is 
actually the number of clusters that existed in the original data set. And it's actually captured the, the centers of uh, each of the Gaussian distributions that I used to generate the, this data set. So that last one was right here. All right, so let's test to see if that's stable. I'm going to execute that again. And, he, and again, we end up with the same answer. Okay, so let's, let's try bumping this up. I'm going to be a little bit more extreme. I'm going to jump this up to seven clusters. In this case, we're really partitioning things much more finely than, uh, than the, the structure of the data really supports. So, so the cluster regions are getting, starting to get smaller. And what we'll probably find is that they tend to be uh, less stable. So I, I just executed it again. And you, you can see that uh, things shuffled around over in this corner here. Let's try that one more time. I think now we've got an extra cluster right, right down in here. It's interesting that that gold cluster is actually taking on a very small number of points. If we, so, so as the number of clusters is going up, especially for this particular distribution of data where the number of clusters is much bigger than the actual number of clusters, the answers are going to tend to be much less stable. Uh, meaning that uh, that points will be uh, assigned to uh, clusters in different ways. So there's uh, one more assignment with 10 clusters. Execute that one more time. And there's yet a different assignment. So now we've got four clusters up in this corner up here. If we, if we actually increase number n enter uh, from 1, That'll tend to make things a bit more stable uh, because uh, it's it's actually executing that whole search process from initial guess of uh, cluster centers through the the learning iterations. Uh, it's executing that a full ten times and then picking the one that uh, is best in the sense of uh, minimizing the total distance between the the set of samples and and their cluster center. So let's. Let's kind of uh, keep an eye on this distribution. They're sort of, the cluster centers are kind of coming in pairs. We've got a pair up here, a pair here, a pair here, and then two pairs there. Let's execute that again and see if that is a bit more stable. And, okay, so not, not so stable in, in this particular case. And perhaps that should be expected in this uh, scenario. So in, that, in this case, we've got a pair up here, a pair there. Um, we don't have the comparable, comparable pair there, uh, but uh, we've, we've sort of, one has sort of migrated up to this region here. So, so we're, we're gonna see more of this instability as, as we assign more clusters. There are formal ways to make uh, decisions about uh, how many clusters we actually need. And it really comes down to a regularization kind of a uh, question. So as we add more clusters, that means we have more parameters. So parameters to describe the, the cluster center. Uh, and so we end up writing a cost function that trades off how well the points are clustered, and, and that's measured uh, in terms of the distance between the points and their cluster centers, and the number of parameters that we actually need in, in order to describe all of these clusters. So, so there are a variety of, of different metrics that do this for us. One of the common ones is called the Bayesian Information Criterion. So BIC is, is what you'll see out in the documentation and the literature. All right, so that's one example. And now it's time to look at another example where the data are actually distributed in a, a very different way. 